This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. And now, on with the show. Hey everyone, welcome to... We're watching here! We're watching here! This is Opinionated Movie Talk with Chris and Perry. My name is Chris Williams. With me, he is the bad boys for life to my Sonic the Hedgehog, Perry Seibert. <laughs> you know, forgive me for saying it, but boy, that makes sound 2020 sound so much worse than it really was, doesn't it? <laughs> those, are, those are the top grossing movies for 2020 that were released in 2020. Uh, I'm looking at the box office mojo list right now of the top 10 for this year, and half of them were released in 2019. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are we are here at the end of a very weird year for movies, a very weird year for everything. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to talk about some movies. We're very thankful that we got to catch up with this year. Uh, this is not going to be our top 10 list for the year. Perry, you said you follow the Academy calendar, correct? Yes. I live by the, I live by the Oscar calendar. If the Oscars aren't happening, the year is not over. I'm not making a list. <laughs> not yet. Not even close. See, <laughs> and I have this weird mental quirk where I feel like I can't cross this year off my list if I don't at least say these were the top 10 new movies I saw in the calendar year. So I'm going to be trying something different this year. I think I'm going to end up having two lists. The first take is at this point in the year, we're at the end of the year. Here's what I saw. Here's what I liked. And then in March, when our critics group votes for things, if our critics group votes for things, I may have another totally different list because – I'm looking forward to February and March catching up with all the screeners that just got dumped on my door. And, uh, you know, that's not a bad way to spend the darkest months of the year. Not at all. So, not at all. So, but before we get into the little bit of a talk about 2020, Perry, what have you been watching? Uh, I am going to go off the reservation and talk about TV. Okay. I believe earlier in the year, I, I talked about uh, having gone through uh, Spencer for Hire, mm -hmm. the old ABC series uh, on uh, on IMDb TV, which you can get through Roku. It's uh, it is it is free on your Roku. There are just ads on the shows. Uh, and I discovered doing research for something else. The entire run of Saint Elsewhere is sitting there. Oh, wow. A show that never got a DVD release outside of its very first season. And so uh, I will be uh, – I, I will admit to being the proud owners of a bootleg set of DVDs of the entire run of the show. But uh, they, they were given to me as a gift. I didn't do anything for them. They were just given to me, honestly, cop. <laughs> and now I can watch them again, and I am for some reason. Instead of watching my DVDs, <laughs> I'm going through them on this streaming service and being reminded – uh, of one of the very, very best shows that uh, certainly was on in the 80s and maybe was ever on television ever. It is a, it is a, it is a blast to go back through this. I, you know, I don't think I've ever seen a single episode of St. Elsewhere because that show was probably off the air before I was a teenager, I would think. Like, what, what, when did that show run to? Really close. I want to say 82 to 88. Okay. Yep, yep. I would have been nine when that show went off the air um but alan seppenwall is a tv critic i i love i love his stuff and he wrote a book a few years ago called the revolution was televised about the age of peak tv and he doesn't write in depth about saying elsewhere but he refers back to that quite a bit as kind of one of the shows that was a you know, one of the harbingers of, hey, here's what's to come with TV, with, you know, the yes. serial storylines and things like that. So I've always been curious about that. So knowing it's out there, I may have to seek that out. It is it is to the medical show what Hill Street Blues was to the cop show. Hill Street Blues just got there first. OK, so it deserves the credit for truly being the revolutionary show on TV and St. Elsewhere is right behind it, especially if you, you tend to, as you will. I know you will do you'll get into a little research about everybody behind it and realize how wide those branches spread from that show. You can, there's a direct line from St. Elsewhere to the Sopranos. Okay. <laughs> you can get there. <laughs> the, 
<laughs> the thing that is so hard about catching up with all those old TV shows is I'm so used to the world we live in now where every season is 10 or 13 episodes that you go back and watch an older show and you're like, wow, every season was 24 episodes. And so there are about two or 300 episodes to take care of. It, St. Elsewhere is not too bad. Just six seasons. Okay. You're, they, they, they got to 100 episodes barely. Of course, there was a famous – this show was, was very, very self-referential always. Uh, it knew what it was doing. It knew it was about television and it made no qualms about that. But there is a there is a great joke in the 100th episode – where they talk about, uh, which of course I, I says I should fill in the backstory. This is important because in the olden days of when the, the olden days of television, a hundred episodes meant you could be sold into syndication and the show would make a lot of money. So it was a big number to get to. And in Saint Elsewhere's hundredth episode, there's a there's a scene where one of the doctors has a has a has a line about how I've got a patient who's who's still alive after a hundred episodes of angina <laughs> that's how that's that's what saint elsewhere did they did jokes <laughs> like that constantly at their own expense uh it's a great show it, check it out and what streaming service is that on it is on imdb tv okay which i believe which as i mentioned is free if you have a roku device i don't know how else to access it but <laughs> or i or through, or through amazon prime yeah actually cause... so if you have prime Yes, because Amazon just brought bought IMDb TV. Oh, so, cool! I did yeah. not know that. Yep, yep. So I w- I think they're developing a lot of shows for that, but it sounds like older shows are kind of its appeal. So I will add that to the list, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of days this winter where I'm inside the house. So I will. Uh... I I will also point out since we're on this topic, and I think you'll find it interesting. Uh, remember the big brouhaha? I don't know how many months ago now, one or two. When uh, when Netflix pulled uh, the blackface episode of Community, yes, uh, it's there on Amazon. Oh, really? Prime Prime also has Community at the moment, and they have not cut any of those episodes, nor are all the episodes from Thirty Rock that were pulled uh, off Peacock. Uh, they're all on Amazon. Oh, interesting. <laughs> because if you th- if you'd like to watch any of those, that's interesting because I thought I had heard too that it was some of the talent between behind the shows that had requested them to be pulled. Uh, and I might yes. have that wrong, but uh, they might have to do some answering to Amazon or Amazon might have to do some answering to them. Or they're saying, you never asked us. You just asked yep. Peacock and Netflix who have to deal with subscribers in a way that Amazon doesn't. <laughs> it's such a weird world. <laughs> Amazon has way more power. They don't care if you watch yep. or not. That's not where they're making their money. Yep. It's such a weird world. The, the, the streaming world is so bizarre. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, I, I'm going to say that, and then I'm going to jump into something that you can also only see on streaming. Actually, you can only see it on Amazon Prime right now. Uh, I've seen a lot the last two months. I've, I think the last few weeks have been almost every night trying to catch up with, with different movies, and there's a lot I want to talk about that I know in future episodes we'll probably hit on, especially when we finally do get around to saying, hey, this was the, you know, these were the things we liked most this year. Uh, but the thing I want to single right out right now is the Small Axe Anthology on Amazon Prime. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I haven't seen all five. I've seen the first three. This is Steve McQueen's five movie anthology about the West Indian experience in, in England. And this is a series I kind of resisted going into because Steve McQueen is a director who has made films I like, but they are often difficult sits, um, both because of their subject matter and because he kind of strikes me at times as a bit cold um but i have to say of the three movies i uh, three of the five movies i've seen or three of the movies i've seen i've liked all of them and one of them is in contention as my movie of the year um i i I, have you seen any of these perry i have not i i have a um i have a similar if possibly stronger reaction to mcqueen than you do okay so so i have been like i want to I, I remember when Widows came out a few years ago, and I, uh, a dear friend of mine was utterly raving about it, and she said, it's so much fun. And I said, is it actually fun, or is it fun for Steve McQueen? And she said, okay, it's fun for Steve McQueen, <laughs> which means it isn't. It's not. It should be. It would be, it would be an even more interesting film were it a little fun. 
but it is not. <laughs> That's not to say it's not good. I liked Widows. <laughs> well, <laughs> but he doesn't do light and he doesn't do fun. And so I'm curious. It, I, I was waiting to find out what the uh, what the general consensus was and then maybe check out the one or two that were considered the best. I didn't really want to jump into all five. Well, having said that, I would recommend my favorite of it. It, it is right now one of my favorite films of the year. Uh, Lover's Rock, which is a film that takes place at a, uh, at a at a house party in 1980s England uh, in the suburbs of London. And it's this party that they had started. They were these blues parties, they were called, that were started uh, because uh, the, the local nightclubs didn't allow black people in. So they started to have their own parties. And this is when they could come and they could uh, – the, the food was served, you know, that was from Jamaica. Uh, the music was the music of their culture. And it was this way to celebrate their culture, to get away from a world that wasn't always Always welcoming and to build relationships and he the second film lover's rock is really it's it's the most beautiful thing i think he's ever done and it's a very warm and energetic and lively bit of filmmaking that just basically it just observes this party from the preparation through the dance party there are several like full dance numbers that he just watches people engage in. Uh, there are one or two sing-alongs that occur. And it is it is lively. It is moving. It is such a celebration of community and celebrating your culture and the escape that this meant. This is the only movie of the five that is not based on a true story. Uh, it was inspired by his aunt. But it is just... I called it the most alive thing I'd seen all year. It's Oh, that sounds great. It, it's fascinating. In its best moments, there's a little bit of a Linklater vibe to it, like a Fast Times vibe, because you're just watching these people interact over the course of an evening, and they're not talking about anything in particular. There's no overarching plot. You're just watching them be. And it's, it's beautiful to watch, and it, it's not harsh at all. It's a very lively bit. Um, so that's Lover's Rock. That's that's the second one. The other two I've seen, I think Mangrove is a really solid court drama uh, about a case that happened in the 1960s, um, and it involved uh, police brutality and police harassment. And uh, that's fantastic. Letitia Wright is really good in it. Uh, I highly recommend that one. And then Red, White, and Blue is the story of the first black police officer in this neighborhood. Um, and it's a little bit more of a traditional story. It doesn't hit quite as hard as the others. But John Boyega gives a fantastic lead performance in that. And uh, so so all three are worth watching. I'm looking forward to catching up with the other two. Uh, Mangrove is about two hours long, but everything else is, you know, barely over an hour so it, it, it's a quick watch too all right i will i i do want to that sounds really appealing and i would be very excited to watch mcqueen do something like that yeah it's, it's very refreshing to see from him um so yeah uh those are the, that like i said that's one of my favorite movies this year um and we're at the end of a year that has for movie lovers been very weird, Perry. I, I mean, it, is that the understatement of the year to say it's been a weird year for movie lovers? <laughs> yes. Yes, that's an understatement. It's been a weird year for everybody. Yes. We're just going to drill down and talk about movies for a while now. Yeah. <laughs> and how that specifically was weird. We don't want to say it's weirder or less weird than anybody else's experience, but this is the weird experience we're going to talk about today. <laughs> well, I, I was thinking about this. We did a New Year's resolution episode uh, at the start of 2020. And one of my New Year's resolutions was to see a movie in the, the in as many different theatrical experiences as I could have over the course of the year. I, I wanted to try going to different types of theaters and have these, you know, unique experiences. Maybe go to a drive-in or an outdoor screening. And um, I saw Sonic the Hedgehog on a Saturday at my local AMC, and that was it. Uh, so... <laughs> Boom. So, yeah, uh, it's funny because I was thinking about that as I was doing a list of the books I'd read this year. And you had recommended um, my year in film. God. A year at the a movies. A year at the movies. Yes. A one man's film going odyssey uh, by yes. Kevin Murphy. And I had bought that as kind of a guide at your recommendation. Like that was kind of going to be my inspiration to seek out other <laughs> things. And what it really became with the, was this uh, this kind of just – way to remember how much I love going to the movies, even though I can't do it. And uh, so it, it became very helpful for a whole different reason. 
But uh, yeah, it's. Did you did you read the whole book? I did read the whole book, and I loved the whole. Oh, so good! You and got to the Thanksgiving. I did piece. get to the Thanksgiving. The Thanksgiving piece. piece is the funniest thing. It's so well written and such a good story. That one's good. Oh. Um, but also, I, I appreciate it. He he gets a little serious when he talks about his experience being in. I think it's Australia or New Zealand on nine eleven. And, yeah. and what that was like. And it, it's really a phenomenal book because he, he is so versatile talking about both the serious sides. He's he's very much a movie lover, but he's also very much a comedian. And, and it just blends very well together. Yes, uh, it's a great book. So um, Kevin Murphy, by the way. Kevin Murphy. I don't think we said it. Yes. So for those who might want to seek it out, yes, Kevin Murphy's uh, A Year at the Movies. Or My Year at the Movies? Uh, my, I, I'm gonna, I have my Amazon up. Let me check. <laughs> My copy of the book's downstairs. I can't get to it. <laughs> Mine is downstairs as well. A year at the movies. A year at the movies. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we've talked about how we miss going to the movies, but how do you feel at the end of this? Do you do you still miss it? Have you found any way to fill to to still see good new movies this year? I don't. I mean, I don't feel like I'm missing anything. I don't. Uh, yes, good stuff came out. Mm-hmm. No doubt. Good stuff was made and released. But not a lot. <laughs> it, it's not a real movie year yet, nor will it ever be, even if we have the Oscars in April or March. But I, I, I haven't worried about it. I don't feel like I'm missing anything, even if I only saw a fraction of the films that I normally see in a year. Now, and I'm okay with that. And I will say, actually, looking at my letterbox uh, earlier this week, I think I've seen more movies this year than I I typically get to see. Now, they weren't all new releases, but somehow I think I wrote more reviews this year, too, than I've written in past years. And because I've had kind of the, the freedom to watch things when I get a chance instead of having to be at a 7 o'clock screening time, you know, f- 45 minutes from my house. Um, mm-hmm. It's been interesting because I there are things I've missed. Um, I'm one of those nerds, and I know you're going to roll your eyes, and I can't, I can't see you, so feel free to roll your eyes. But uh, <laughs> I'm one of those nerds who about mid-May went on YouTube and found the, the audience reaction to watching the final scenes of Endgame. <laughs> and, and, and how they all burst into applause as the portals open. And I, I got teary eyed because I missed that experience. Um, there are things I've missed. I've, I have oddly missed having a Marvel movie this year. Um, you know, even, even if after Endgame, my first thought was I could use a bit of a break from that um, because that was a lot of movie. Uh, it was a lot of content, but uh <laughs> You, you know, I, I missed having that. I missed having those events to kind of latch on to. Um, because as bad as half the summer movies are every year, I love summer at the movies. Um, I love Christmas at the movies. Like, this is the time of year we would have, we would have probably about this time of year been sitting down for two days in a row with the Detroit Film Critics Society, just binging movies for two straight days. And I miss that we didn't get to do that this year. Yet. Yet. We'll see. It might still happen. Sure. But not in 2020. There, there's No, not in 2020. But even with that, like those big events, those big things that I usually pin my year on or that make up, you know, a good bulk of my movie going, it's been very interesting to have those studio releases out of the picture and have that kind of rush of this is what everyone's going to be talking about. So this is what you have to write about moved out of the picture and been able to say, okay, you know what? This sounds interesting. I want to watch this. Oh, this is getting some attention. Like, I don't know that any other year I would have been able to, I would have actually been able to take the time to watch a movie like the climb um, before screener season. Have you seen the climb? I have not. Okay. Movie that was, it was just passed along last year, a few months ago. Um, the screener was available. It was described as a buddy comedy. I'm like, well, I like those. I'll check it out. Uh, and it's a fantastic movie. It is, it is a movie I probably wouldn't have gotten around to until screener season uh, otherwise, because there's no way they would have done a, you know, a large theatrical screening for this. And if they did, it would have been at 12 noon at an art theater while I'm working. Um, and, and I got to watch that. 
you know, from my room at 10 o'clock on a Thursday night. And it was great. And I loved the movie. And it was, you know, beautifully composed. And I think by having that kind of deluge of like, these are the big, you know, movies that the studios want to get in front of you. There have been some really fun stuff I've got to catch up with, but I also got to catch up with old movies. And I kind of got to watch movies on my terms this year, which was nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, agreed. I, that, that those were absolutely absolute advantages to it to to this very weird year. Yeah. But and the same reason why I'm saying it's not a real year. So I don't mm-hmm. really I don't feel like I'm I mean, yes, I am missing the sensory experience of being in a movie theater, for sure. But Half the reason I go is to, you know, is to pay attention to what the art form is doing and it doesn't feel like it's doing anything this year. And so that's okay. I don't, I don't have, you know, I'm missing it syndrome. And so that turns out to be, I find out through all of this, one of the big impetuses for me to go to the movies. It's not just the sensory experience. It is, it is taking part in this culture, in the film culture. Yeah, and it, it's been so weird to see what has gotten pushed. Like, I, I think I came to the conclusion very quickly that aside from Tenet, which I know some people who really like, the movies that finally made it to theaters were movies that theaters were just kind of like, yeah, we can afford to let this one go. Um, and, and that was very weird to see. And, and the movies that kind of got pushed were these, you know, pushed via online screeners and stuff, were, were some of these smaller movies that they weren't going to make a hundred million dollars. Kajillionaire is not going to make a hundred million dollars, you know, in theaters. Yeah. Um, and some of those got a little more breathing room. Um, my, my Twitter feed was not talking a lot about Tenet when it came out because no one had seen Tenet. I had a ton of critic friends and movie loving friends arguing back and forth about, I'm thinking of ending things, which would have utterly disappeared if it came out in a year where, where there's a Marvel movie out at the same time. Um, and we did a whole episode on, I'm thinking of ending things and yeah, it, you know, it, it was fun to watch those get to be part of the conversation. It was good to see that. You know what? It was a weird year. We didn't get to see a lot of movies, but that didn't mean I still had to like antebellum or the war with grandpa. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, it was still the, the crap was still there. And I may have to actually break down and, and uh, pay for a month of HBO Max to see the Soderbergh, you, which, which I really want to. So uh, you're gonna ha- he's doing a few movies with HBO Max because the one yeah. he just filmed in Detroit, which was actually filmed at my work, is also an HBO Max release. I'm not surprised. He's <laughs> he tried to figure this out a few years ago with Logan Lucky and realized. I can't play that game. I don't know how to play that game. They're kind of right. So where can I go that they're going to give me money and leave me alone? Yeah. It's, That's where they'll go. It, it's funny. I was talking, um, I was on a podcast a few weeks ago talking about the news that HBO Max was, you know, going to be the home for all of Warner Brothers 2021 slate. And, Let's be honest, that's going to be a good portion of their 2022, 2023. You're not putting the genie back in the bottle there. Um, I don't know. You might. You truly might. I don't I, I don't want to say that. I, I truly can't say that that's the end of that. Well, I, I do want to get to that, but I wanted to also bring back, because I, I do think there's a, there's a part of that that is not going away. But the point I was making to him was but what you said. Soderbergh did this back in 2006. You know, when when Bubble came out and he had the idea, let, you know, put this on DVD, put this on TV the same day it's in theaters. He saw where this was all going. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the thing that happened with HBO Max is strictly because of the pandemic. I think it's also because AT&T, who owns Warner Brothers, has a new streaming service that A... They botched the release of horribly uh, because half the people who have HBO Max don't realize they have HBO Max. And also AT&T would love you, love it if you watch those movies on your phone and uh, the data, they could reap reap off the data of that. Um, Mm -hmm. So, so that was, that was a weird, that was a big news story when that happened. Um, And I was kind of surprised. Oh, I wasn't really surprised that Disney didn't follow suit because they're doing okay with their streaming service and there's, you know, a Marvel movie is a instant billion dollar hit for them. They don't want to lose that revenue. 
Um, but I, I'm going to be really curious, like how this HBO Max thing plays out next year. Oh, absolutely, and it will be interesting, especially if if theaters do. I mean, you know, what we don't know is how well, how quickly things return to quote air quotes normal. Mm-hmm. When can theaters reopen? Will people go out? Those are the big questions. If in June everything's really close to, you know, 80, 80, 85 percent back to normal box office wise. I don't know. I can't figure I don't I don't I don't know the numbers. They get to hide all the numbers on streaming. I don't understand what makes Warner Brothers and their parent company the most money if they can continue to live a theatrical life and then have these things be exist solely on their streaming service. They'll continue to do so. I, you know, I, I don't, I, I have no feeling for it. I, I have no understanding of <laughs> spending a whole year having it and not just be like that. They've said that, right? Like it's not just going to be on the stream. Right. Service. If theaters are open, they'll put them in theaters too. But uh, I don't know if, I don't know if that's enough to keep theaters open. I, I think you will see, I, you'll see a boutique market open up pretty quickly for, uh, studios maybe actually buying theaters again mm-hmm. and taking control of exhibition. That might be what they do. It might be worth it for them to, it, you know, it's, I, 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 they can cut it being a lost leader and take some more of that money. <laughs> Not that it's still a lost leader when it's in theaters, they're still reaping money. So I don't, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 it was a cynical corporate move. That's what it mm-hmm. was. It was not about anything else. They want to see if this will work. They pissed off a lot of really powerful people making that decision who are going to lose a lot of money. And so I don't know what happens with that then. I don't know if, you know, the studio that was the last remaining giant that actually would give money to real filmmakers for their vision <laughs> are going to lose the trust of all of those artists who will go find someplace else to make their movie. I don't know. I, I am curious to see what the fallout of it is. I am, I, you know, I, I truly don't know. I truly don't know. You may very well be right. I, 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 I don't argue the point to say you're wrong. I argue to say I don't think you can say for sure that it's that that's the way it will be going forward from that point on. It might be. It very well might be. But I, I, I have this. I, 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 I don't think. I, I just can't envision it rearranging that quickly i think the theatrical will always be there nothing what i don't understand what replaces it as a thing we all go do socially <laughs> alone together <laughs> i don't understand what take that and that that that's necessary and i don't understand what replaces that if if, if with so i don't understand how movie theaters go away well and i'm curious to see what happens it's like you said once once there is a return to something like normal like if you can at least get to a point where the majority of states have theaters open which right now is not the case and a vaccine is out there and people start venturing out then i think once there's a normal there's a rush to have these communal experiences again like if next summer the vaccine yeah. has reached out, you know, a good portion of the population. I don't think you're going to be able to to keep uh, baseball tickets in stock. You're going to see every concert filled. And I think you're going to see movies be, you know, this really big experience again. But then after a year of people getting used to being back to the movies and HBO Max has said, well, you know, all the Warner Brothers stuff is here. I, I do wonder if it's this weird hybrid where... Yeah, there's something like King Kong versus Godzilla, which is a movie that if you're not seeing it on a big screen, why the hell do you even make that movie, right? Like, I I, I think those will be movies that people still go to on the big screen in large numbers because there's an experience there. Whereas a smaller movie, um, you know, David Chase's Sopranos movie that that's coming out. Is, mm-hmm. that, is that something that now those mid-budget movies... You know, they're more – this is the way it was headed anyway in many cases. Are those your Netflix and your HBO Max releases? And do the theaters – you know, it, when an AMC theater goes out of business, does Warner Brothers or Disney say, guess what? We're buying this. You want to go see a – you know, you want to go see an Avengers movie, you can come here and see it for 20 bucks and the best sound possible. 
Mm-hmm. I, it, it's going to be a really interesting time because maybe maybe that also happens with independent you know studios where there are really good boutique you know experiences maybe that alamo draft house experience becomes a more regular thing i i think the movie industry shifts either way because of this i'm very curious like oh sure like as someone who who is very interested in seeing what happens to the industry and the way streaming's been affecting things I'm very fascinated by this, and yet there's also that part of me that's very terrified. Like, don't take this experience away. I, I don't. I don't want to be watching everything from my laptop. And you and you won't. I I I I, I feel confident to say you you won't. But yeah, it's possible that movie theaters become like museums. You know, it's hard to believe people still pay to look at art hung on a wall, but they do. <laughs> and yeah. that's why I think they will always be theatrical. I think the same logic applies, and that's a much more deeply ingrained habit in in 21st century Americans than the other. So that's why I am hopeful that there will always be publicly shown films. My, my hope is that my, – my, my big hope that is that the biggest benefit to this could be that – all the people who love to go to the movies and text and, and talk realize, oh, I can do that at home now. And it just creates this pristine experience for all of us. That That is that is my dream for this year, this coming year. So uh, it, it would be nice to get yeah. them out of there. So, um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's going to be a big change to watch in 2021. Um, yeah, I... I I don't have a transition into our list, uh, but that's okay. But that's that's okay because the other thing I wanted to talk about was, uh, and, and we had both talked about this earlier. M- another one of my uh, resolutions this year was to watch more films on the Criterion Channel, which uh, I had famously subscribed to about a year and a half ago, <laughs> and it languished for about eight months without me watching a single movie, and I. Th- <laughs> I think my goal this year was I wanted to watch two a month on Criterion Channel, and I didn't quite get there. Um, but I did watch a lot on Criterion. I did watch a lot of older movies. Uh, this was a great year if there were gaps in your knowledge to uh, to fill them a bit because, you know, why not, uh, you know? And so uh, you had brought this up that th- this this might be a good topic. Uh, the movies we got to catch up with in 2020, and we've we've both put together three. And uh, Perry, why why don't you kick us off? What what was your first, and what what? How much did you see this year? I'm I'm always curious. You you watch so much, and uh, hang on, I'm gonna put you on speakerphone so I can go through my uh, yeah my list here. Sure. Can you still hear me? I can hear you perfectly. All right. I can barely hear you because I don't know how to make a speakerphone work on Skype because I'm old. All right. But I will tell you as I'm scrolling through my list because, yes, I do keep my list on my phone. I am that 21st century enough. Let's see. All right. Starting from – let's see. One, two, three, four, I have seen 60 films on the Criterion Channel since April 8th. Wow. (laughs) And I only have that as the cutoff because I keep my list going. I mark the beginning of the calendar year and April 8th was when Criterion debuted. So I keep it. I keep track by, you know, a couple of different ways. And I didn't want to figure out when March was, but we'll call it. And and all the three films I'm going to talk about, I did see there. Not that it's the only place I saw films, and I did see new films as well this year, of course. But yeah, I wanted to talk about films that I finally saw. And I, I cut this into three divisions. Okay. One is the film I'm embarrassed and I should have seen by now. Okay. <laughs> one is the one I had always wanted to see and just never got to it and finally did. And one that I would have never watched had it not shown up on the Criterion channel at a time when I could watch whatever I wanted. All right. <laughs> like you were saying, when I don't have to be at a screening 45 minutes away at 7 o'clock, two nights a week. <laughs> so we'll start with the one I should have seen by this point, And that's uh, the 2011 Oscar winner for Best Foreign Language Film, A Separation. Okay. Uh, which I think we talked about here. Uh, yes. Asghar Fahadi's, uh drama about an Iranian couple that splits is perfection. 
I, I don't know what else to tell you, Chris. It is, it is, it has the power of a play. It is written so directly and so succinctly. And in that way where with great plays where you're watching and the next scene happens and it totally shifts your focus about the characters while not violating what you know about the characters. And it's not that your sympathies change. You just realize things are running deeper than you thought. And it manages to do that with every single scene until you get a portrait of where this marriage is slash was by the end of it. It's great. It's really spectacular. I am ashamed. I didn't see it nine years ago when it was glowingly reviewed. Then Uh, I regret I didn't see it before I made my best of the decade list that year, (laughs) that decade. Uh, uh, This was, uh, you know, this was cinematic malpractice on my behalf. I apologize to the movie gods. This is a great film. And I am embarrassed that I still have not seen it. Um, because I, I remember like when I remember when it came out, everyone was talking about that movie. And yeah, I think that was the year I got married and that just did not seem like a movie I wanted to watch the year I got married. And, um, I just never got back to it. Um, but that, that is one I'm going to have to add to my list. Is that still on criterion? It is not, Damn it! but it might come back. They, they, they lose stuff and stuff comes back. Okay. And if you pay special attention to if you uh, again, if you are a Roku owner, the uh, the watch TCM service, mm-hmm. if you have a cable subscription and can access Turner Classic there, uh, a lot of those movies overlap. You'll find a lot of overlap between uh, what's on T- watch TCM is also often on Criterion at the same time. Uh, the same interestingly, same thing with HBO Max. Uh, their TCM section has a lot of uh, Criterion stuff on there as well. Yes. Um, yes, indeed. In fact, I would say if you're not sure yet, if you want to sign up for Criterion Channel, but you should. Uh, but if you're still not ready to, to make that commitment yet, I, I think HBO Max is a great little way to wade into it. Their TCM <laughs> section's really good. Um, but and then Criterion Channel kind of just plunges you into the deep end with that. Um, exactly. Well, well, one of the picks I picked, actually two of the three picks I have were movies I saw on Criterion Channel this year. Um, and the one I'm going to talk about right now is one that I talked very briefly about in our Thanksgiving episode. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about it more. Uh, and it's Police Story. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I talked about this in the context last time that I was thankful for stuntmen. Um, but watching Police Story, one thing I really realized is that I'm thankful for Jackie Chan. Um, <laughs> he's been around for such a long time that it's very easy to take him for granted. Uh, but Criterion put a ton of his movies on the service this year. And I didn't get around to most of them, but I did get around to Police Story. And Police Story 2 is still up in my queue. Um, and it's just, it's so much fun to watch him work. Uh, police story is a movie that has such a bare bones plot. It is a police story. Uh, you know, it is about a cop and I can't remember any of the other details about it, except he fights and (laughs) boy, does he fight. Um, and there are stunts in this movie that are amazing and so much fun to watch that entire, that entire sequence at the mall at the end is just so much fun when he's in the department store and the mannequins are around, but then also when he jumps off the balcony and grabs onto the light fixture and and he's sliding down and the bulbs are popping under his hands. And it's so cool that they play it twice. Yeah. And then in the outtakes, you see how he almost destroyed his hands doing that. Yes. Um, and, And so it's, it's a great piece to watch if you want to see great stunts. But the thing that it also reminded me of, uh, that after years of him doing a lot of really bad family movies is really easy to forget is he's such a great physical comedian because there's also a scene where he answers like five or six phones at once. And he's twisting and contorting his yes. body as he's answering this. And it's just as enjoyable to watch as that last stunt sequence uh, because he's so graceful when he does it. And we just we live in an age where, you know, as, as big as our action movies have gotten, very few of them actually feel tactile or dangerous. Like someone's, you know, someone's health is at risk while doing this stuff. That doesn't happen much anymore. Maybe you get like a John Wick or something like that. 
But watching Jackie Chan work, you just you're reminded that oh, his movies don't have special effects. He is the special effect, <laughs> and there there are a few things more enjoyable than watching a really good martial arts sequence to me. Like I. I just love watching that. I love the speed and the grace and the humor he throws in. Um, Police Story is really one of those movies that I was kind of surprised to see show up on Criterion Channel just because, you know, I still sometimes associate it with really heavy stuff, which isn't the case. Uh, you know, some of the stuff on there is very heavy, but I'm so glad they threw this up there because it's just a joy to watch. My favorite sequence in the movie still uh, and as great as the mall sequence is and as entertaining as that phone sequence is, the sequence early on where he's got to convince that the woman he needs to protect needs protection. So he sends his partner in to act like he's going to attack her. Yes. She knocks him out and then he runs in to save the day and he has to pretend to be fighting with his now unconscious partner. <laughs> is so good and so funny and makes such physical sense when you watch it. It's so good. It's just, it is like the movie doesn't get as good as the movie is. It doesn't get better than that moment for me. <laughs> and which is high praise. It's, it's, it's a truly brilliant sequence. It is yeah. the equal of anything you will see from the great silent comics. And, and you know, it is better than that because the technology is better. That's the only reason it's better, but, but it is. And it's, uh, yeah. If you, if you see nothing else of Jackie Chan ever watch that sequence. Yep. So good. Yep. Uh, that's police story. I think it's still on criterion channel. So uh, check it I out. don't know. A oh, lot no. of those left. Oh, okay. A lot of the Jackie Chan's have left. You I can think. still track but it down I, pretty I easily. Try. It's other places too. I think you can rent it at Amazon. Yes. I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> what do you got for number two, Perry? I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go to the one that I would never have watched had it not just popped up on the Criterion Channel. Okay. At this point in my life, and that is a, a, a little gritty little sports drama from 1956 called "The Harder They Fall." I don't even think I've which heard is of this. a it's a boxing film, and actually it's not a boxing. Well, it is a boxing film, but it's more. Uh, it, it, it was adapted from uh, a play by Bud Schulberg who is also the author of uh, On the Waterfront mm -hmm. and many other great films of the 1950s. And uh, this film is about a, a, an old-time boxing writer who is hired to basically write a series of articles to hype up this young, dumb kid who this promoter is trying to make into uh, the heavyweight champion. Uh, of course, he's probably just writing this kid until he, so he can make a fortune off him and then drop him. Uh, but what makes this stand out, on top of all of the really wonderful... Uh, obvious Bud Schulberg moves throughout the movie. It was very good dialogue, very funny dialogue. Uh, it's a very cynical film in a lot of ways. It is Humphrey Bogart's last movie, and he mm -hmm. plays the sports writer. And it is a pleasure to watch the, <laughs> the old Bogart uh, in this role to still have a bit of that that great sexy coldness that Bogart had, <laughs> uh, especially around boxes again. To be to be uh, uh, to be the king cynic among all the cynics is is how we like to see our Bogart because then we always like to see that pierced by the end of the film and watch him be the only one around with some humanity on him. Uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's just a pleasure. It's a '50s program to be sure, but it's got a bunch of really great people in it. Rod Steiger's in it. Uh, it's great to watch Bogart with these people who were among the next wave of actors. And still playing very, very classic Hollywood tropes. It's, it's, it, I mean, it's a 50s film through and through. Uh, but I enjoyed it tremendously. And I'm really happy I got to see it this year. That's fantastic. The harder they fall. Check it out. Now, when you say you wouldn't have checked it out if it hadn't popped up, were you just scrolling and you saw it? And we're like, yeah, I'll give it a whirl. Or Yeah, it showed up. And I think they put it, if I remember correctly, uh, every Saturday Criterion program is a double feature. They just pair two films. You don't have to watch them together mm -hmm. by any means. But they paired uh, The Harder They Fall with Raging Bull. Okay. And I thought I, – I, and I can't remember if I'd watched it before. I saw that it popped up there, and I realized, I don't know what this is, and did a little research. And was, oh, Bogey's last film. Yeah. All right. Let's do this. And I was so glad I did. <laughs> 
Well, that's fantastic. I, I, I love it when there's those surprises like that. And Bud Schulberg uh, wrote A Face in the Crowd, which is one of my all-time favorite Indeed. movies. So uh, yeah. that, that might be one to catch up with one day. Um, my next movie is actually one that I wouldn't even call that great. Uh, it's a movie that I saw and recognized its flaws, um, but I'm still thankful I saw it. Uh, it is Steven Spielberg's The Color Purple, which I had not seen before. Um, and earlier this year, I started a a project of watching all of Spielberg's movies to write about, um, and I got as far as The Color Purple. Um, and and then, <laughs> and, and I didn't stop at A Color Purple. It was more around the same time as A Color Purple. I started, ended up, uh, that's when when screenings be, or screeners started coming out like left and right, and I just got consumed by them so uh they they moved west side story back so i'm still on track to do it next year it'll be written up on my website it'll be great uh and we'll start with empire of the sun which i'm very excited to catch up with over christmas break uh but color purple i had never seen before and i had kind of always stayed away from it because it had this this kind of reputation as being very stilted and and kind of dry and so i hadn't really just made much of an effort to see it um and, and i saw it and even as flawed as it is, there's a lot I like about it. I, I think Whoopi Goldberg is really great as a woman who has been through hell her entire life and is still trying to, to you know, to get by and find reasons to smile. I, I, this was her first performance, I believe, and uh, she's fantastic. Like it, it was a reminder of how good Whoopi Goldberg can be, uh, and I loved watching her. I loved watching Oprah Winfrey and Danny Glover in this. I think the cast is really good. Uh, Quincy Jones's score is really memorable, and there are sequences that I think work really well. Um, there, there's a scene where Danny Glover's character is trying to assault someone and he's, he's on horseback running through the woods and it's like watching a silent film as he whips through the trees. Uh, it, it's a fantastic sequence. Um, but the reason Color Purple has stuck out in my mind is because it fascinated me so much because it's very much a director who you can feel trying to make his masterpiece. And the only yeah. thing holding him back is that he is not good enough to make a masterpiece yet. Um, it, it is, I, I think one of the critics at the time called it the first Disney movie about incest. And <laughs> that is how it feels. This is a movie that has, very dark elements to it. It's its character, its main character goes through hell the entire film. She has just the worst childhood and adulthood. But Spielberg can't quite delve into that. And he he tosses in physical comedy at some points, which feels so out of place. Or he, he makes sure everything is undercut with a smile or with a you know just the, the happiest ending and most emotional resolution to a scene. And I thought that was that that fascinated me to watch it because it was so apparent. A maybe Spielberg shouldn't have been the one making this movie in the first place. Um, a white man probably should not be the one telling this story. Um, and I think he said that at the time. He ultimately he he originally didn't take on the role, but Quincy Jones, you know, pushed for him to have it because he wanted to have Spielberg behind this story. Um, mm -hmm. But it's also fascinating because while the Spielberg of 1985 could not have made this movie, I so believe the Spielberg of 2005 could have made the movie that this you know, tackled this a little bit deeper and a little bit better. Um, and, and that's what stuck with me is this movie of a this feeling of a director trying to make his artistic, you know, his the movie that is going to buy him respect as more than just the popcorn director and the thing holding him back is he is not ready to do that yet i think that's fair and i think i i think that's fair and i think that's also overly kind <laughs> <laughs> i think he makes many of those same mistakes in many of his much later films that are also supposedly the serious films i don't know if you remember war horse Oh, I remember <laughs> Warhorse. That's there's there a... are a lot. Then there and Warhorse has is 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 certainly deals with some dark stuff, 
but you know, it's only really dark about the horse. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason why I said the Spielberg of 2005, not the Spielberg of 2015. The Spielberg who made <laughs> the Spielberg who showed up for Munich could have made this movie. <laughs> he might have, but I still think Munich would be better. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I finally got around to it. You know, it got that one off, off my list. So, uh, that's the colored purple. There was, there was a lot I enjoyed. There was also a lot that I was like, eesh, but, uh, you know, I, I got it. Yeah. I got it done. And and now Empire of the Sun's next. And that's by all accounts, that's one that I, I'm looking forward to. So you've never seen it. I have not seen it. No. Oh, let me know when you watch it. Okay. I, I'm planning it's, over Christmas it, break. It is. It is the serious one where you can tell he does have some sense of real attachment to it. Okay. It's 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 inter- there are people who like it much better than I do. Uh, it's also really fascinating now because um, you will watch a very young Christian Bale make all the faces that Christian Bale makes as an adult. It's just remarkable. Like <laughs> he really hasn't changed <laughs> since he was a kid. <laughs> Like his entire acting style is still the same. He's just grown into it <laughs> in a really, in really effective ways. It's a good movie. It's it's absolutely worth seeing. Okay, I, I can't wait to see it then. Um, what is your number one, Perry? Uh, I, 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 and again, I, I just the third one we're talking about. I don't, I don't, I don't wish sure. to rank these by any means. The um, there is a film I had always wanted to see that had just always gotten away from me for years and years and years. And it is, I believe, if I remember correctly, it's either the first or second film of Stephen Frears uh, that played in theaters after his many, many, many films for the BBC. Uh, a little film from 1980, I want to say four, uh, called The Hit with Terrence Stamp okay. and a very young Tim Roth and, and, an, and an always great John Hurt about uh, a hitman who uh, – well, no, a, a gangster who basically – who – who informed on his friend on, on the gang he was working with, uh, and then uh, years later, a young hitman and an old hitman are sent to get him and to bring him back to the people he needs to answer to. And that sounds like the most you know <laughs> the most obvious B movie premise on the planet, but what it is. Is this, and I'm going to sound, this sounds really stupid. And you'll, then you'll see, you'll go, yep, I have no other way to describe it. This is a work of philosophy. Mm. This is, this is a, a Terrence Stamp's character throughout, throughout 99.9% of this movie is this utterly Zen-like figure. And Terrence Stamp was born to play anybody in this state. Just, <laughs> he is an ethereally beautiful man his skin is so great he is just a a marvel to look at and always has been on top of being a really good actor he just has amazing presence on film and this and Stephen Frears just leans into it hard and you fall under the spell of this guy who is obviously being taken to his death and is utterly at peace about it and utterly and, and there are points where he starts, you know, messing with the hitmen who have come to get him a little bit. And you're 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 sitting there going, you're wondering if he's doing this to stall, if he thinks it's going to be OK or if he really is this calm and serene with what's happening. And it's a great performance and a a wonderfully layered script that uh, that it's not a twist ending but you don't see the end of this movie coming and it makes you realize what you've been watching is different Hmm. (laughs) than what you thought you were watching. It's one of those endings, not in a huge grand way, not in some, it's all a dream way. I wouldn't ever, I'm not, I don't mean that in the slightest. I just mean thematically you realize, Oh, that's what we've been doing. Boy, we did that good. (laughs) And I, I, I was so happy to finally catch up with the hit for, for all of these reasons and many more. Uh, it was, I, I finally got to see it around the time I rewatched the limey, uh, with the great commentary track by Lem Dobbs, Dobbs and Steven Soderbergh, where they fight over cause Lem Dobbs, Lem Dobbs takes umbrage with Steven Soderbergh's, uh, changes that he made to the script. It's <laughs> because then the critics pointed out how bad the story was. <laughs> 
And Dobbs said, and I take the hit for that. And you were there. <laughs> You're the one that changed it. I didn't do that wrong. You made the mistake in cutting it. You wouldn't have gotten those complaints if you hadn't cut these scenes. It's a fantastic commentary. <laughs> totally worth sw- listening to. Uh, it, it was up for a while on the Criterion channel as well when the movie was. So, yes, I was I was in a, a, a Terrence Stamp reverie uh, for, <laughs> for a week over the summer. And, uh, uh, yes, the hit. I think it might still actually be on there. I hope. Uh, yeah, check it out. Uh, early Stephen Frears and – uh, you can see you can see all the great fears that comes from it. Fantastic! Um, that that you're making me add up my list for things that I might watch over Christmas break. I have a <laughs> I have a week. Yay! I have almost two weeks off work coming up, and uh, I am planning to shut down the internet for two weeks. So I need to build up that playlist. <laughs> um, my number one. I feel like I may have talked about a little bit in one of our what we're watching episodes. Um, but but this one was definitely a movie that kind of crossed all those buckets. Uh, it's a movie I hadn't seen before. I knew I needed to see it. Uh, and it popped up. I, I was browsing Criterion. I saw it was on there. Um, and it, it is the best movie I have seen all year. Uh, it is Umbrellas of Cherbourg. Uh, oh, which so good. I, I think I told this story on the podcast. But if I didn't, I'll tell it again. I watched this about a week after we were first put shut home, sent home from work and put in lockdown and everything. And I work at a university. And so we had a ton of communications that we had to send out to our community. We had to figure out how we were going to communicate things over the next you know few months, keep content, you know, keep sending messages out when people contracted the virus, let people know if they needed to quarantine. And I was working, I was working until 10 or 11 each night and just exhausted and wasted. And, you know, just the, the kind of the stress that we all felt at the beginning of this, where we don't know what the hell's going on and how long this is going to last. And I had one night where I'm like, I, I remember the thought being like, I just need to see something beautiful. And I pulled up Criterion Channel. This was on there. And man, this hit yeah. The, you know, th- this hit me right where I needed it to hit me. Um, for those who aren't familiar with Jacques Demy's film, it is a mu- musical that is not like any other musical I've seen because there are <laughs> not, you know, there are, there are motifs and themes that come back in the music, but literally every word of this movie, the dialogue is sung. And it's an opera. It, 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 and it's so, it sounds so, like at first it hit me very weird when. You're at a garage and the mechanics are just talking to each other in song. And I'm like, what, what is this? And then you just realize it, like, it's just, it's so beautiful to watch. It's such a melancholy movie at the, especially at the end, that scene at the gas station, just, it, it just leaves you in this place of melancholy, uh, but it, it's also just one of the most gorgeous movies I have ever seen. I think yeah. Pat Oswalt on the uh, on the one of the special pieces on there on Criterion. I think he describes it as like cotton candy wallpaper. Um, like everything is just these bright colors, and you just watch it. And it, it it's not a you know it's not a poppy happy movie. It is a very kind of bittersweet, wistful movie about a young couple uh, that is in love and he goes off to war and she stays back and there are complications and nothing ends up quite, you know, where you think it's going to end up because, you know, I, I don't know, like with musicals, there's usually a very set way this ends and this doesn't, this goes into more realistic directions and more, you know, bittersweet ones and, it was just a movie I sat with for a night and was so like, I felt so revitalized after I had seen it after, after just soaking in this movie for a bit. Um, And it also made me realize I have a lot of friends who have seen La La Land and don't realize how much that movie owes to this one. Um, And I like La La Land, but man, if you think La La Land's the pinnacle of musicals and you haven't seen this, you got to check this one out. Um, I, I don't know. This is one of those movies that is hard to talk about because it really is about the feelings it evokes. It's such a gorgeous, bittersweet, beautiful thing that you just have to experience. I, I love this movie. I, I can't wait to watch it again. Yeah. I uh, Yes. <laughs> Everything. 
you just said yes it's it is it is a fabulous fabulous piece of work it is that is yeah it's unlike anything else it's it is such it it is it is a movie musical yeah <laughs> it will not work it is it is not a stage adaptation it is not it, it would not work in any other art form than a movie no and oh oh it's gorgeous yeah, it's so good. It, it is like it, I love the music, but this is one of those ones I could also watch on mute and I, like just have his background while I'm doing something because it's it's just the, it's so much fun to look at. Like the colors yes. are beautiful. Catherine Deneuve is just so wonderful in this. Uh, I, I love this movie. I I really need to uh, to watch it again very shortly. Do so. I feel like it would be a very do so over this Christmas. I, I do feel like it is a very good Christmas movie because of where it ends. Um, I, I, I should try that. <laughs> so anyways, those are the movies we caught up with uh, in 2020. Um, yeah, and that brings us to the end of a very weird year where we did some of my favorite episodes. Because one of the things I didn't bring up that I considered when I was putting my list together, I wanted to purposely avoid movies we had done entire episodes on. But I, sure. I could have easily put Smoke or Casino on this list uh, as first time views for me. <laughs> uh, and, and they were movies that I, I got to see for the first time. And, and I love that. And I think by not having that deluge of movies to try and plan everything around, we got to have some really fun episodes this year. So I, I'm thankful for that. Absolutely. And we're, me too. We're going to have some more fun in uh, 2021. Uh, we'll be back probably not in two weeks, but sometime in January we'll be back and we'll figure out, you know, what that's going to be. And we have some fun things in store. But in the meantime, Perry, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Perry Loves Film. You can hear me every Friday morning on the Lucy and Lance show on WLBY 1290 AM in Ann Arbor. You can uh, find me on Facebook. Uh, you can often hear me at the Cathode Ray Mission podcast. Uh, and let's see. I, in fact, we have an entire episode devoted to David Fincher coming Ooh. up if you want to go even deeper into the world of Fincher. And uh, let's see. Yeah, this is the year you'll definitely – I'll definitely be back in a theater this year, right? Sure. Definitely. That's going to happen. Sure. If not, you'll be at home reading the year at the movies again and uh, exactly. back there. Exactly. Or just by going deeper down the Criterion Radical. There you go. <laughs> Uh, you can find me. Um, I, I put out a weekly newsletter at criticisms.substack.com. That kind of puts out any writing I'm doing, any podcasts I'm doing. I also do another show occasionally called Cross Culture Critic. Uh, it tackles you know pop culture, faith, things like that. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at Mere Christianity. And I have some other fun things in store that are going to be starting up in 2021 that I can probably tell you a little bit more about in one of our next episodes. Until then, Perry, have a great Christmas and a great new year. You too, Chris. Take care.